Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Leadership Speak series at L Forum. Today, it's a privilege and honor to welcome our guest on the show. Um, he's been an inspiration. He's been a role model to me. And uh, he is probably one of the reasons why I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So without further ado, it's my honor to welcome Mr. Shibulal to our show today. Hello, sir. Hi, how are you? I'm fine, sir. How are you? Good to see you again. You're looking nice. good. Really happy to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you, sir. So, sir, as I, I shared with you, uh, <clears throat> today's uh, uh, show is about wanting to get an insight from you about entrepreneurship, leadership, and your learnings. So uh, my first question to you would be, sir, uh, in your long journey as an entrepreneur in the early days and uh, how you and how today Infosys is an iconic organization globally, what was your learning as an entrepreneur and then as a leader, sir? So I think um, it's important to remember the context in which Infosys was um, launched. Infosys started in 1981. So it was a completely different time, right? It was a time of um, regulatory constraints. It was a time of resource constraints. It was a time of license raj. And Infosys got launched with a seed capital of US dollar 250 by seven people. Okay. And, and we were basically for middle class. Uh, we had no money no wealth, money, of course, $250 was there, but no wealth, no political connection. But we clearly believe that um, there was an opportunity to build a globally respected corporation, right? And we took two bets at that time. The first bet which we took was that technology will become ubiquitous over a period of time. So remember, this is in 1981. There was no cell phone. There was no internet. There was no laptop. There was no PCs in 1981. <laughs> but we took a bet that technology will become ubiquitous. So if you look at the history of Infosys, that bet played out over a period of time. Mm -hmm. Second is we took another bet that service industry will get globalized. So if you Look at 1981, manufacturing had got globalized. So um, a, a Reebok, for example, was producing shoes in China and selling it in US. Okay. That had already happened, but that was not true for service industry. The work, the worker used to go to the work. So let's say there was work to be done in New York, the worker will fly to New York. The work was not moving from New York out. So that was the second bet which we took. So both played out over a period of time. But one very clear learning I had about this bet was that ideas are dime a dozen. The true value gets created only when you execute on that idea. Awesome. So over the next 20 years, we executed on that idea, right? The technology became ubiquitous, probably everyone else did. But the globalization of the service industry was clearly, clearly executed by Infosys. So we built the global delivery model. We created a worldwide network. We went out and convinced our customers that this can be delivered from India. So that fundamentally, those two bets play, played, not only played out, we executed. And that is how the value got created. So the first learning I can share is the point that Ideas are diamond resin, but value get created only when you execute on the idea. Awesome. And Infosys is a very good example of that. Now the second learning, so there are many organizations which started in 1981. Infosys was not the only one, not many actually. Entrepreneurship was not a accepted word in 1981. There was no capital available. There was no, um, you know, no mentorship available. 
But there were a few more which got created in 1981. I think one clear difference I've seen with Infosys and others is that we stayed on, we stayed together. We lost one person in 1999, but if you look at it, 2014, three of us retired together. Retired is a big word, so you retired. <laughs> retired, as together. <laughs> but the point is, if you go across the history and try to find out another corporation where so many people have stayed together as founders for such a long time, I doubt whether you will be able to find one. So the strength of the finding team founding team to stay together. And over a period of time, if not in the beginning, we created complementary skills and mutually ex exclusive, but complementary skills. So it became collectively exhausting. Yes, right? I have seen that in action. Right, so if you look at uh, Mr. Murthy's, um, you know, um, you know, I can respect him for many, many things, but entrepreneurship, if you look at uh, Chris for innovation, if you look at uh, Nandan for, um, um, you know, um, Nandan for um, leadership, every one of them, every one of us developed different facets of competency. So it became mutually exclusive, but collectively exhaustive. Skills. And we stayed together, right? So that is, that is the second uh, um, most important learning which I have the ability to stay together. And that happened because we all brought into the common purpose. Purpose. We gave up our personal aspirations and brought into the common purpose of creating this globally respected corporation. So putting the organization ahead of the personal um, uh, aspirations built Infosys. So that is the second uh, most important learning I can I, I can share. Sir, just that's a beautiful point you raise and which is kind of something close to my own uh, <clears throat> passion. So was there a good understanding of vision, sir, at that time? Did all of you have a common vision? Was that evolved or was it a journey that you, uh, you know, no, you've had over the years? I'm sure it was a journey, but I think the vision was there that we will do we will create a corporation. We will create a corporation. Of course, I think the vision got formed in our case early on. Um, so we create the, the originally the vision was to create a globally respected corporation, providing technology services worldwide with world class set of people. It was it was something. It was a little longer, but then finally it came down. Oh, to I still remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Right. Globally respected corporation, best of breed solutions. <laughs> but finally, it came down to three words. It came down to global corporation respect. Yes. Right. So if you look at anything which Infosys has done, right, if being a corporation is about being sustainable, being long-term oriented, balancing um, short-term versus long-term, being de-risked, being profitable, um, you know, there is a bunch of things which you need to do. All of them rolled companies. into these three buckets as such, basically. All these, All of these three buckets. Three. Respect led, led you to, um, you know, while focusing on growth, making sure that you do the right things at the right way, you respect the spirit of the law, you, um, you have the best, you know, financial disclosures, things like when in doubt, disclose. Mm -hmm. Right? Or... Um, under promise, over deliver. <clears throat> yes. So all of those led to respect, performance. Performance created recognition, and recognition created respect. Absolutely. So the respect word led to all of these facets of behavior and global. Absolutely. So operating globally, having global clients, having global workforce, having global development delivery centers, all of that global. So these three words in many ways actually draw every single action, sometimes uh, tacitly, sometimes, sometimes explicitly. Excellent, excellent. Right. So the vision is very important and the, the vision has to be lived up to, it has to be lived with, it has to be lived in. So that's how you achieve it. And after all, finally it's a journey. 
Sir, initially you were a smaller group, but how did you manage to imbibe this vision in the last miles or to the person who was probably at the edge of the whole journey? Um, could be anyone, you know, the front lines basically. It so had I to happen, that... otherwise this couldn't have been so successful. What was that, sir? So I think the most important thing is to articulate. I think it's important to articulate because especially uh, if you have a very large organization, it is important and that requires clarity of thinking in the mind of the leaders. Excellent. Right? So if you have clarity of thinking in the mind of the leaders, then you can articulate. You can say what it means to be global, what it means to be respected, what it means to be... And then you can example, you can give examples of activities that you do or examples of uh, instances where you actually work towards that goal, work with that goal. So I think the first uh, important thing is to articulate, that's one. Second is uh, leadership has to walk the talk. It's very important, people will not believe in words, but people will believe in action. So you have to make act. So you cannot, on one side, you cannot say we want to be a globally respected population and then you do some short term um, activity, which is which will not um, be consistent with the philosophy. With the, with the philosophy, right? So, number one is articulation. It's very important to articulate. Number two, so for example, one of the philosophies about respect was about to be fair and honest to all the stakeholders. Yes. So, employee stock option plan was a good example of that, right? Okay. Because we have a, we had an employee stock option plan which actually created wealth along with the shareholders for the employees. Excellent, yes. Right, so you have to walk the talk. So that's a number two. See, number three, a lot of this is also a, 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 a belief and value system, right? So there is a certain number of belief and value system. And um, if you find there has to be a system by which you will encourage that behavior and discourage bad behavior. <clears throat> right? So, there has to be instances where behavior which will not create respect or, or, or so-called behavior which is um, um, not in line with the belief, with the organization belief has to be seen as uh, discouraged yeah. right? or, or, uh, or disciplined, whichever way you take it. Mm -hmm. So three parts, you know, one is clear articulation, second is behaving, walking the talk and third is having a system where the incentives and the disincentives are aligned towards this, this system. Awesome. That's, that's very, very important. The other question that I had, sir, is, you know, as you evolve, obviously, organizationally, you were more a simple structure to become a conglomerate and you had a global organization. Today, it's, it's I mean, it's probably present in, I don't even know how many countries today and how many hundred thousand people work in Infosys today. Uh, how did the leadership, as in at the next level, sir, how were the leaders who evolved? Was there a different styles that you needed for each stage and each phase of the growth? And uh, were they more entrepreneurial initially and were they continue to be entrepreneurial or how was it, sir? So I think, um, um, first of all, I think if you uh, look at us, um, I don't think you will find many corporations where somebody has joined as a software engineer or as a project manager and became the CEO. That is generally unheard of because people unheard. mostly... Yes. Um, um, so a lot of people will look at my, my career and say, okay, Shibu, you have worked for Infosys for 35 years. Um, and, but the point is that there are actually 10 jobs. They're not one job. People don't see that transition sometimes, right? Because I started out um, as a, a project manager to start with, right? And so my job was to manage projects, manage a small set of people, some five people doing something. And it, it, was, it was more about um, technical knowledge, a lot of technical knowledge, a lot of technical leadership, a little bit of people management. That was it, right? Then at some stage, I became an account manager. Account manager is managing clients, which is completely different set of skills, right? You are, um, you are negotiating with the client. You are actually uh, managing client expectations. You are delivering to those expectations, um, right? And you are advising the client. 
on certain matters. So your skills have completely changed, right? And then at some stage you um, become um, a PNL head, right? The moment you become a PNL head, then you are you are now starting to worry about your entire unit. You are starting to worry about revenue and profits and uh, uh, utilization and various other facets of uh, being a PNL head. And then you are faced with attrition. You are uh, you know various other things. So the learning is is completely different. The skills are completely different. And then you became, you know, I, I had a journey afterwards. I became head of delivery, then head of sales, then chief operating officer, and then chief executive officer. So each of these positions are so different and the skills required are so different. So the most difficult part is not to learn something new. The most difficult part is to forget what you learned. <laughs> Correct. Right? You, will, you will lean to your area of comfort, yes. You will lean to your area of comfort. So you really not only have to learn new things, you have to let go of the old things. So that is true for anybody who is taking this journey, right? Anybody who is taking this long journey in, in, in career. So that applies to, uh, the, the trick is to make sure that you still have the entrepreneurial spirit. Because as you get into more and more of these situations, you, you need to be very disciplined. You need to be very, um, you know, um, uh, decisive, right? But you still have to keep the entrepreneurial spirit in your mind. You should be actually flexible. You should be open to new ideas. You have to be willing to learn new things. You have to be adaptable. At the same time, you have to be disciplined. You have to be um, decisive in, in, in doing these things. So as you go on this journey, you create new skills, but at the same time, you keep the, you keep the entrepreneurial spirit in your heart. That's very critical. So here's a question, sir. Uh, is entrepreneurship in your DNA or is it an acquired skill, sir? So for me, it was an acquired skill. I can argue both ways, very honestly, because, uh, you know, I, if, okay, so if I look back at my school days, I used to do things which others have not done. So was mm -hmm. it entrepreneurship? I don't know. Or was it DNA, basically? You had it it in sorry, you. correct. Was it DNA? I don't know. But if I look back at my journey of the last 34 years, it is acquired, acquired skill. Um, because I think whatever I had as a student or a, um, in my student days, all, I, I think they were so, nascent i wouldn't consider it as um, consider it as uh, a dna so in my case it was um, learned skills but i still today i see a lot of youngsters who have it in the dna right uh, who have it in the dna and they 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 it's quite possible that it's in the dna but i think the dna is it's evolutionary dna right when i was born entrepreneurship was not a word which existed so you you are saying it's in the DNA because now the environment has that in the system. So uh, a bit of that influence shows up. So I had to learn a lot. What, what were the challenges in the journey that it, it, I'm sure every day was a challenge, but if you were to look back from those early days when you took that big plunge to becoming an entrepreneur where going and uh, getting a steady job was probably the benchmark for a person of you know a middle class background what were your challenges that which came to you sir you just still kind of sticks in your mind that these are the biggest challenges i faced in this you know illustrious career of yours so um i think um, one thing um, which is true then and one thing which is true true today is that it is a marathon it's not a sprint yes, i've heard you say that <laughs> so if you are in employment if you get into an employment uh, it is uh, so it depends on what kind of employment I I was born or I I was I lived in an era where it was all about lifelong employment. People used to just join the government and that was it. You are yeah. done. You okay. you know, 35 years from now you will retire. That is the definitive answer. Uh, so that was the world in which I uh, you know I lived. So the fact that it's a marathon is is very important to keep in mind to understand. Uh, there are no easy way out. There are no shortcuts to success. You have to do the long haul. You have to put in the hard work. You have to put in the commitment. You have to uh, be very focused. I think um, that is one. Uh, 
I did not find it very hard, right? So I wouldn't, but that is one of the learnings I had from, from that journey. Um, second, um, you were asking about challenges, right? So there was always um, uh, a, a certain set of, um, so the, the other challenge would be to take a long-term view. It goes hand in hand, right? So we live in a society where short-term views are uh, appreciated more. Right. So my father-in-law could never understand why we lived in lived a very nomadic life. <laughs> right. One day we will be in India, the other day we will be in Boston, third day we are in uh, some other place. And so my father-in-law couldn't understand. He was a very nice man. He profoundly allowed me. But he used to say, Shibu, where is your home? Why is that you don't have a house? Why is your suitcase your house? <laughs> uh, right. 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 So, so it's a good example, right? Because you, you have certain sacrifices which you make in your life to take this journey. So one has to be willing to willing to do that. Excellent, sir. I think, uh, and, and I have we had the privilege and honor of serving under you and learned so much. I've learned so much that it is difficult for me to put it in probably, maybe someday I'll write a book, who knows, with your help I might. <laughs> but uh, I have been a big positive recipient of uh, whatever you just now shared. I've, and I'm very grateful to you and Infosys for all the opportunities you gave me. And I hope we continue to have opportunities to work together. And- uh, So Ingo, I want to make one last point. Yes, sir. So always remember, we were extremely lucky. The Infosys folks, Seven of us were very, very lucky people. So one of the other things every entrepreneur needs is luck. You can call it luck or God's grace or being at the right place at the right time, but luck is a must. See, if you look at our situation, we were lucky that we started in 81 and India got liberalized. So we were there at the right place at the right time. We started in a sunrise industry because the industry grew leaps and bounds after we started. True. We started, seven of us, seven of us started and we stayed together. So we were able to find or join hands with a set of people who, who was willing to put the purpose ahead of everything else. Then we, had Mr. Right? then we had Mr. Narayan Murthy as our leader, who is older, wiser, whom we all could look up to and all could go up to him and say, we are fighting with each other, tell us what to do. Right? No, it's important. So I think luck is an extremely important part of uh, this journey. And I believe Infosys invited that luck by being fair and honest and transparent and, and, and uh, um, you know, being, having a set of middle class values. Uh, so I also believe that we invited that luck by doing a set of things which were right. Um, and, and being fair to all the stakeholders. Very true, sir. So I think uh, my last question for today's session is, I'm sure you did give us a lot of nuggets in terms of advice and it'll be invaluable. I would love to see it myself. I'll probably read down the tapes and see it myself. What would your advice be to uh, aspiring entrepreneurs and leaders? What would be uh, something they could keep with them through their journey? Or this marathon, as you say. So I think um, you know uh, today's world is very different than when Infosys got started. Uh, but the things which I talked about, whether the the idea and the execution paradigm, execution creating value, the founding team staying together, running the marathon, having a set of good values, being lucky, I think they all hold good even today. But there are two or three other more points I will add. In today's world, capital is abundantly available. Whereas we, in 81, there was no capital available. At least I find occasionally the capital gets substituted for innovation. Capital is never a substitute for innovation. The innovation is, you have to, when you're building, a, uh, when you're doing an entrepreneurial journey, you have to have innovation and speed at the core of your um, being. So capital cannot be a substitute for innovation, right? So that is something which we need to always uh, always keep in mind. 
secondly shortcuts do not last right you have to take the long haul there is no shortcut you have to take the take the long haul and um, um infosys was lucky enough to start thinking globally then is infosys started globally on day one so that that helped so you have to think globally um, as a startup so the two three points which i wanted to add number one capital is not a substitute for innovation innovation has to be heart of every entrepreneur secondly doing the there are no shortcuts you have to be willing to um, take the long road to success and um, you 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 start globally got it sir and don't lose your purpose i think that that is uh, very big that is so so close to my heart purpose is so important if you don't have purpose sir uh, you don't know why you exist sometimes right it is it is the core of your existence i feel purpose mm -hmm. so sir can't tell you how thankful i am for finding the time and uh, speaking to me it's always a pleasure speaking to you and thank you sir and uh, yeah, and on behalf of everyone on my forum i thank you thank you for your kind words and uh, hopefully i get to see you when i'm in bangalore next or when you're in boston next i wish you very well and uh, stay safe sir thank you for everything thank you thank you very much